A very warm welcome. We're joining you tonight at Hyde Park on Other Dharana 24 as we've heard of joint trade union action against government's tax policy and concerns on how these taxes hit the most vulnerable communities as well as uh, the, the lower strata of communities. At the same time, we're talking about the equality of uh, and, and how fair these taxes are, but how necessary at the same time these are for an economy. However, to get an understanding about tax policy and to get an informative understanding of how these taxes affect us individually and how it benefits the government or the people at large, we invited to our studios a, a specialist in tax policy and a consultant, Mr. Suresh Pereira, Principal Tax and Regulatory of KPMG Sri Lanka. A very warm welcome to you. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's, it's good to see you. I think we last spoke during budget 2022 back in uh, November. And this time around, I think um, more than your opinion, we just want to have an understanding of the facts here, Mr. Pereira, in terms of where this tax policy is. But let me start off about your opinion on these um, current uh, concerns in terms of how these taxes affect individuals. Yes, actually, I think uh, we, nowadays we find uh, many people are discussing about these uh, tax changes, but actually these uh, income tax changes have been in the air for a long time. It's only now that uh, the companies are paying the salaries and deducting the amounts and giving, so then only they see the real impact. Mm -hmm. So that is why I think that the uh, general masses are getting uh, concerned and uh, that's why I think uh, they're all complaining now. Uh, but as I said, these uh, changes have been uh, they are for some time, mm -hmm. right? So, with regard to my opinion, uh, with regard to this uh, ta individual tax changes, mm -hmm. well, we can see uh, in relation to the individuals, the minimum uh, liable threshold has been reduced, and also the tax slabs have been reduced, and also the tax rates uh, earlier it used to be up to 18 percent has gone up to now 36 percent. So, these three uh, changes uh, taken together with a couple of other changes like earlier we had this thing called expenditure relief or deduction and that has also been uh, now scrapped. For instance, uh, earlier uh, interest on housing loans was deductible in addition to that, expenditure on health, expenditure on education subject to certain criteria were deductible. So now all that have been taken out. Mm. So I think uh, this is the reason why the individuals are concerned. But we have to keep in mind it's not only the individuals in relation to the corporates also the taxes have changed the rates have gone up etc right so but uh, since uh, we are going to discuss uh, more on individuals uh, let's uh, focus on this but since you mentioned corporates here uh, there's concern that corporates remain silent because they are not taxed enough is that so okay <laughs> in relation to the corporates uh, we can see now almost all the corporates uh, are paying a tax at the rate of 30 percent mm -hmm. earlier okay there were uh, companies paying taxes at the rate of 14 percent and the manufacturing companies paying at uh, 18 percent uh, and then the, of course the standard rate uh, rate etc right so now in relation to corporates also the rates have gone up uh, whether corporates are not being taxed enough I'm sure if you ask the owners of the corporates uh, they'll say no you're paying enough for taxes but uh, that's where it is but I think the the, the focus of Tonight's discussion is on individuals and uh, how much they're taxed or how little some are taxed. So that's the concern here because there are protests, there is objection and there seems to be disparity in terms of how uh, taxation policy has been implemented. If you may shed some light to us. Now, we were initially introduced to a, a, a tax policy and then there were amendments brought together. But we're trying to understand, we are no experts in this. So we, we, we'd like you to shed some light on this. Yeah, rather than uh, speaking on the general uh, changes uh, that were introduced uh, at the beginning, mm -hmm. but let me, conf uh, let me uh, focus some more in relation to the recent changes that have happened in relation to what are called uh, taxation, tax on employment benefits, right? Now, now what is this uh, concept of uh, 
employment benefits. Now, as you know, when a person is uh, working for an employer, that person is entitled to get a compensation package. And that compensation package normally twofold, or there are two components. There is a cash payment, the basic salary, and benefits. Benefits like sometimes a fuel is given, sometimes a vehicle is given, sometimes a accommodation, so many things, right? Even shares. Now, in relation to this second compo co component, the benefits, uh, now both these components put together, that is the cap cash payment and the benefits put together is what's called profits from employment. So profits from employment is liable for income tax. Uh, in order to ascertain values to be added to the basic salary in relation to the benefits, no, normal practice is uh, under a particular section, section 27 of the Inland Revenue Act, the Commissioner General issues a circular. Mm -hmm attributing values for selected benefits like shares, accommodation, fuel, etc. Right? Uh, so, somewhere in uh, December, I think it was 22nd of December, three days uh, before the Christmas day, there was a circular issued uh, in relation to that. Mm -hmm. And then this circular was uh, revised uh, two months thereafter on the 7th of February, not two months even, no, uh, 7th of February, but to be effective from the 1st of, uh, Jan first right. of January. So, we can see a set of uh, revisions here. Now, I think, uh, let's, uh, let me shed some light with regard to these revisions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and as to, let's see whether, what is the impact, who's benefiting, etc., in relation to this. Because I think uh, most of us uh, have not still uh, realized uh, exactly what is happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, there, have, there have been statements with regard to this uh, revision saying that, okay, the taxes have been reduced or taxes have been eliminated in relation to benefits, etc. So, let's let's focus on this exactly what has happened here. Right. right? Uh, so, let's see. Now, in relation to certain benefits given, there hasn't been a change. For instance, basically some, when you are working for a company, so some companies give shares to the employees as a part of the compensation package. The rule attributable that has not been changed. I won't go to the rule because it's a technical part. I'll try to just explain the uh, changes that have happened. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, there are companies that give uh, accommodation, houses to their employees. Right. Uh, of course, you find this in the both public sector and the private sector. Mm -hmm. Right now, in relation to this uh, practice, where basically benefits uh, benefit uh, by way of a house is given, accommodation is given, uh, that's again the value to be attributed in calculation, the calculating the income tax is specified by the Commission General in this particular circular. So now that uh, that basically we find has been a has been sub, uh, changed. Mm -hmm. so, right now earlier uh, this was basically dependent on how much how much of the value to be attributed to the house given was dependent upon the salary of the employee whether he was below two hundred thousand or above uh, two hundred thousand a month salary category mm -hmm. and the dependent on the geographical area and the a percentage. Now, if I this take is uh, as per the two thousand twenty-two December twenty-second circular yes. that it was yes, attributed to the entire um, uh, salary package remuneration package. Not the remuneration package. This is in relation to the benefits. The benefits. Right? benefits okay. Right. So that benefit valuation criteria have been revised. Mm -hmm. Now that is where I'm going to uh, right. focus on the changes. Okay. Right. So. I will get take one criteria. Right? Now, for instance, uh, let's say if a house is given in, in say, in a rated area, let's say Colombo, mm -hmm. and uh, if the person's remuneration was uh, about two hundred thousand, about two lakhs, mm -hmm. then the value to be attributed, added to for salary purposes, for tax purposes, was twelve point for twelve point five percent of the salary, mm -hmm. or forty thousand, whichever is lower. Mm. So, right? regardless of what kind of house or residence. Yes. You are given by your employer. Yes, depending on the depending on the, so the value to be attributed dependent on uh, his uh, salary category above two hundred or below two hundred, uh, and, and the geographical location and uh, this ceiling that was there. So there was a ceiling of forty thousand, okay. right? So if a house was given in uh, Colombo, mm -hmm. a rated area, and the person's salary was above two lakhs, mm -hmm. so I'm looking at the highest category. Yeah? So it was 12.5% of the salary or 40,000 which ever that was lower. Mm -hmm. So in other words, when you do the number crunching, you can see if the person uh, received a, salary, a remuneration, or not the word salary is not the word, the remuneration above uh, 320,000, 3 lakhs and 20,000, uh, that's where the 40,000 maximum keeps it. So any person who was receiving a salary over and above that had a benefit 
because only 40,000 he had to pay. 12.5 mm. of the salary of a say, person was getting 450,000 for a month mm. was much more than the 40,000. But he had to pay only 40,000. He had to add only 40,000 for the purpose of calculation of the tax. Mm. Right? So now what has happened is two changes are there. One is this ceiling has been taken out. Mm. That 40,000 cap, the ceiling is no more. Mm. So it's 12.5% of the salary. Earlier, 12.5% of the remuneration. So there's a difference between these two. Remuneration means it includes uh, allowances, uh, etc. Right, the whole package. When you say salary, it and could be a, a tiny chunk of your entire yes. How pay. It, yes, how it has been drafted is salary is also defined. The word salary, definition of the salary to be taken from the widow's uh, and often pension fund or uh, provident fund. Right. So when you go to those two acts and look at this definition of the salary, you can see the allowances have been allowances won't part won't make part of the salary. So in other words, the concept of salary is a small component compared to the uh, compared to the remuneration. The other uh, benefits of uh, other yes, cash other, yes, allowances. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. All okay. those allowances are excluded okay. uh, in in the concept of the salary. Mm. So now what happens is a person who gets a high uh, basic salary now will end up paying 12.5 percent of 12.5 percent of that without a ceiling. So he may be called upon to pay more than 40,000. So if you take the case of a private sector, say chairman of a company who is getting a house, uh, now we'll have to pay 12.5% uh, of that sal sal of that uh, package, salary, uh, remuneration, uh, salary, yeah, sal mm -hmm. the salary uh, without a cap. So not 40,000, now he will have to pay more than that, more than right? That. Mm. Whereas uh, if a person has a low basic salary, and it's designed in such a way it uh, packages a low basic salary and uh, more benefits, high benefits. Mm -hmm. Now that person stand to benefit. So does how how does this work? Now we're talking about we we're continuing to talking to talk about the private sector. Doesn't this apply to the state sector also? Who are employees? Is 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 uh, uh, are the cabinet ministers and the president also? Uh, liable to these taxes? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Now, it's a good question. Now, this concept of uh, who is an employer, who is an employee, what is employment, all all three terms are defined in the Inland Revenue yeah. Act. Yeah. This is not a common and popular meaning. This is not uh, the definitions uh, that uh, we find in labor statutes. So, there are specific definitions given. Now, this question is a very good question. So, now, in relation to employment, there is, there is a specific definition given. So, one element of uh, employment is a person who is holding a public office is considered to be in employment mm -hmm. and person who is engaged in employment is an employee and any person who even pays remuneration to the employee is considered the employer. Mm -hmm. So now the good question that you ask in case of a, uh, in case of a cabinet minister or in case of a president. Uh, is he liable for this uh, employment taxes? Yes, he is liable for employment taxes. So, president is uh, uh, considered in employment because he is holding a public office. The question to be asked is, is the president holding a public office? If the answer is yes, uh, then he is in employment. Mm. Then, the, then who is his uh, employer? The person who is giving his paycheck, the person who is paying the remuneration is the uh, employer. So now that person has the legal obligation under the act now to deduct the employment taxes, we call it uh, uh, advanced personal income tax APIT and remit to the Inland Revenue Department. So how does this, uh, the benefit on residence is given, granted by an employer to employees, uh, how does this calculation play when it comes to, uh, let's say a cabinet minister uh, for whom okay. a residence is given by the government? Yeah, so, so as we all know, basically, uh, normally in the public sector, mm -hmm. uh, how the salary, is, how the compensation package is designed is uh, the basic salary is low. They give many allowances and uh, the benefits. So now here what happens is uh, because of this formula, mm -hmm. uh, where basically you calculate the 12.5% on the salary as opposed to the remuneration, mm -hmm. because uh, as I mentioned earlier, in case of remuneration, allowances are included. In case of uh, salary, allowances are excluded. So uh, maybe sometimes uh, people in the public sector may stand to get uh, a benefit because of this one. It's, you have to evaluate each case and see separately. But uh, 
I mean, as, as, as much as we know, uh, the state sector, of course, we know that uh, they have salaries, they have other allowances that add up to it. So when it comes to, let's say, cabinet of ministers, does this mean uh, they might pay either 40,000 or just be um, taxed 12.5%? regardless of whether this is a mansion or a small one-bedroom studio. Yeah, just, just one correction there. That now this 40,000 concept is, is not, not there, there, right? So we are talking 12. about 12.5 percent. 12.5 percent of the basic salary. Whether it's a, a tiny one-bedroom uh, studio apartment or whether it's a mansion, you will still be uh, taxed 12.5 percent on your on salary. salary, which could be a tiny portion of your entire yeah. remuneration. Could be. Could be. Yes, true. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. So, it is, so right. is yes, does right. this mean, wha wha I'd like to take you back to these two circulars. What's the purpose of these two circulars? Because I understand that this was issued, as you explained, back in uh, December 2022, and then revised in February this month, uh, last month, on the 7th. Again, um, it states that the first was uh, uh, issued in terms of Section 27 of the Inland Revenue Act Number 24, of 2017 and then the the amended version says this circular is issued on the instructions of the secretary to the treasury uh, by the letter dated 7, 20, uh, 7 february 2023 what is the purpose of the uh, the circulars issued by the commissioner general of inland revenue okay but before coming to that i'll just add uh, something to my uh, my previous uh, comment mm -hmm. now in relation to accommodation uh, there's another change also that i have to mention that is basically earlier in the old circular the residence or the accommodation included even the security laundry mm -hmm. uh, servants uh, maids etc that were given right so in calculating the taxes so residents included that also now that has been taken out so because of that so we presume that uh, if a servant is given, if a security given, laundry given, that should be uh, taxed separately uh, according to the market value is uh, my understanding. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed to see what will happen to that, right? So that, that of course, uh, I would say uh, maybe I, will, I don't know they'll come move, but it's a, that will, it means that, that means that basically the uh, particular person will have to pay tax on those aspects, the, the laundry, uh, et cetera, right? So I'm the question, the question that you asked. It, but I before think we go there, I'm ask, I would like to ask you once again: it, Does this mean uh, whether this this amendment uh, seems to be uh, benefiting ministers and those in public office, office than the private sector? Uh, okay, <laughs> good point. Basically, when you analyze this uh, thing entirely, you can see uh, yes. Uh, there's, there, there are certain benefits that are coming for both the uh, public sector as well as the private sector. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are uh, certain benefits that are that will be enjoy that could be enjoyed only by the uh, uh, people in the public sector. That too, in relation that too, if they are uh, if they are uh, how do I say in a particular category. I'll come to that one also. There's a okay. separate uh, change there, right? Okay. So should I take that yes. one first? I think? Yes, I, uh, I, I think we should yeah, look okay. at that. Yeah, so they are what happened. Now there is this uh, new introduction that has been uh, introduced. This was not there in the earlier circular. That is, there are persons who are entitled, let's say, for a vehicle or for a, for a fuel quantity or maybe communication facilities due to the phrase used in the document here is due to a circular direct directive or a regulation issued on behalf of the government. So due to this criteria, it's a classification, persons who are entitled due to circular directive or uh, regulation issued on behalf of the government. So that means basically you're talking about the public servants, right? Uh, so how about the practice that we see in the public sector is, uh, though they're entitled for this car, they don't take the car in lieu of, in lieu of that, they're paid a cash payment. So they, they are given a, traveling allowance, they are given a full allowance, right? So now this rule says when in a scenario of that nature, let's say basically instead of taking your car, you get 100,000 cash. So that's, that traveling allowance is uh, liable for tax. Now you basically as a employee in the private sector happens to get a traveling allowance, allowance of 100,000, on that 100,000 you have to pay tax. In so the normal way. If we, if if we do not obtain that uh, fuel al oh allowance yeah. or uh, in the form of fuel or any other benefit, but opt for a cash allowance, 
you will still be taxed on that. Yes, allowances, 100% tax in the normal way, right? Mm. So now here, here, let me explain this one in relation to this uh, public sector thing, right? Now here what happens is, uh, those who opt for cash uh, allowance, instead of taking the vehicle or the fuel quantity, this rule says, if, if the person, if that public servant gets uh, uh, 100,000, that 100,000 is not taken for tax. Mm. Only 25% of will be taken for tax. 25% of the travelling allowance, 25% of the uh, fuel allowance will be taken for tax. Mm. Now this is where this concept, uh, this uh, issue of discrimination or basically, what do I say, uh, equality before the law, the issue comes up. Now here what, uh, what we can see is, uh, there is a classification, there is a category. Uh, one, one, one set of uh, people who will be entitled for a different treatment, a beneficial treatment, whereas all the others are discriminated. They are not getting that thing. So now this, you have, do I use the word public servant? You have to keep in mind, this is not for all public servants also. Mm. It's only for those public servants, uh, public sector, where this concept, where they are falling within, where they are entitled under the circular directive or regulation issued by the government for a vehicle or a fuel quantity or communication facility, right? So only a selected so who category is the will fall. Category? So this could be basically right now when you say again public servants, uh, now let's see, you say the state banks, yes. people in the state, uh, employees in the state banks are not uh, eligible for this. Mm. This is only those who are in the government departments is what I have been told. Right. So, so there in Sri Lanka, there are about 79 government departments. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the ones who will be uh, subject to this relief. Are we, are, we, are, we, are we looking at uh, a policy that actually uh, treats the private sector and the pri public sector a select group uh, in a different way? Okay. So again, I would I'd like to uh, explain. This is not exactly public sector, private sector issue. Mm. This is, a, you can take even two public servants. Mm -hmm. So one person, due to his, due, because he's entitled for a uh, vehicle, under the circular or the directive issued on behalf of the government, he's getting this benefit. Whereas another public servant who's not falling within that uh, circular directive or the regulation, mm -hmm. who's not entitled for that, he's not getting it. Mm -hmm. So the discrimination could be even there also, the even, even within the public sector also. Now I'd like to add a little bit uh, something yeah. uh, interesting here. So the question here is, is this distinction or is this, uh, does this amount to equality before the law? Mm. Is there a violation of the equality before the law? No, under Article 100 and, uh, sorry, Article 12.1 uh, of the Constitution, uh, we have this concept of the equality before the law. So the question, the issue here is, is there discrimination uh, here? Mm. Mm. All right. Now, this, this issue of uh, tax policies, tax policies and the concept of uh, equality before the law have been uh, tested uh, in uh, courts in Sri Lanka as well as in uh, other countries also. Now what the courts have taken, uh, what the courts, uh, the position that the courts have taken uh, is that when it comes to formulation of tax policies, courts are very slow to get uh, to intervene. Courts take up the position. Uh, it is for the parliament to design a tax policy. Right, because uh, they know the circumstances. The courts will get involved only if there is manifest uh, discrimination and uh, if they see uh, there is a uh, violation only. Right, so they give uh, very wide discretion uh, to the uh, parliament to, to do this uh, classification. Now, again the courts have uh, pointed out, uh, so I'll, I'll read it from a particular case, right, so it says, uh, Parliament has the right to classify, but this classification can't be arbitrary. This classification uh, should have some kind of a rationale, yeah. right? So now, so there has to be a rational basis and there has to be an intelligible uh, differentiator and the differentiator must be, must bear a rational relation to the object sought to be achieved by it. And arbitrary, arbitrary uh, classification, arbitrary selections are not permitted. Now I'll give another example. Now, you know, basically we had this concept of the tax amnesty. So there were people who had not paid taxes, the tax uh, evaders were given uh, pardon, concession. Uh, and then there was the, there's the other category, people who have paid taxes genuinely on time. 
So is there uh, discrimination or is there equality before the law when you give a concession or a pardon to the people who are not paid the taxes? Right? So this matter in the tax amnesty case, of many, many tax amnesty cases have been contested. So the courts pointed out that parliament has the uh, discretion to classify and courts took up the position. Uh, in the national interest, parliament has uh, done the classification and in the short run because they, they had to make a payment to get the to, to qualify for the amnesty right uh, make an immediate payment and thereafter in the long run they will come to the tax stream so therefore they will be contributing to the tax revenue in the long run therefore uh, courts took up the position the object sought to be achieved by the act or the bill uh, was being fulfilled by this classification Therefore, it is justifiable. So now here again the interesting scenario is now we see two, uh, two, uh, two classifications or two, two groups here. People who are entitled under the circular directive for, the, uh, for this uh, concession and people who are not. Now is this classification rational? Is this uh, classification intelligible? Is this classification bearing any logic to the object sought to be achieved? What is Objects ought to be achieved here. In case of tax amnesty, okay, bring more revenue to the uh, tax system mm -hmm. to get the more the evaders back into the tax net. But here, what are we doing? What is the object we are trying to achieve? So my my personal view is that if a fundamental rights uh, case is filed in relation to this issue, courts will, of course, at the end of the day, it's the courts that will have to pronounce uh, with the. Uh, this is uh, in violation of the Article 12. In my, my personal opinion, is there is a greater chance to sustain that there is a discrimination of the uh, category that are not getting this benefit. That this benefit should be extended to all, not only to uh, one category. But there again, uh, let me permit uh, speak a little bit on this issue. Right now, now you pointed out about this uh, preamble to this uh, circular. Issue, circular. Right now, this is interesting. Now, now. The power of the Commissioner General. If, if, you, if you may give me a minute, we'll take a short break here at Hyde Park and return to speak more on uh, tax and how this affects individuals. We're in discussion with Mr. Suresh Pereira, a specialist in taxation, accounting and legal matters. We'll be back to discuss more. Welcome back. Uh, we are discussing about the government's tax policy and how these in fact affect individuals, corporates uh, or other individuals and uh, especially private sector and state sector employees. Uh, we discussed about who employees are, who an employer is. Uh, I also wanted to ask you, I don't want to discuss this matter, I'm sure you don't want it to because this, there is a case, but are Supreme Court judges and the President also liable to taxation? Okay, since there's a court case, uh, I'm not in a position mm -hmm. to speak about uh, that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, in case of, uh, let's say, normal cabinet ministers, president, uh, yes, liable. Yeah, other if aspect, they're I holding a public mean. office. Yes, any right. person who is holding a public office is uh, in employment. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if we go further to talk about uh, the, the circulars uh, that, that I asked you about, what was the purpose of this these two circulars? And also, um, we, we were discussing how a certain particular category is exempt or not exempt rather is given relief, relief. In, in some way or the other through this new amendment brought together. So what's really yes. this, the, the yes. purpose? Yeah, so let me, let me uh, try to add more to uh, what I was telling before mm -hmm. the break. Now, uh, so in my view, this classification where certain persons who fall within this, uh, circus, this uh, yeah. circular directive or regulation, issue, uh, regulation issued by the government, uh, getting this 25% uh, uh, relief thing, in my view, is in violation of the constitution, mm -hmm. is in violation of the article 12 of the equality before the law uh, aspect. Because what is the object to be achieved? Is this classification related to that object? This is not like the tax amnesty uh, case. I don't know how to justify that one, right? So now, in addition to that, there's something else also, something interesting. Now, at the beginning, I said, uh, in case of a benefit valuation, there is a section, section 27 of the Inland Revenue Act, that provides 
uh, that provides uh, or empowers the Commission General to attribute uh, values to, for the benefits to be taken for the tax purposes. But then that is for benefits. Commission General's power is confined to attribute values uh, in relation to benefits given. So what is a benefit? Basically it has to be a car, accommodation or something like that in kind, right? Or not when a cash payment is being made. Now, to me, basically that's ultra wide powers. What Commission General is saying, okay, when 100,000 travel allowance being, being given to uh, this category of people who are qualifying within this uh, category, only 25% of that to be uh, taken for tax purposes, he's going beyond his powers because Commission General does not have the power to grant uh, concessions of that nature. Now, again, we look at the uh, article, uh, the constitution of the country. Article 152 of the constitution says that only parliament has the power to imp in impose taxes, increase taxes, reduce the taxes also. Now here what happens is indirectly by this mechanism, taxes are being reduced by the Commissioner General's this document. Now this is why it's interesting. Now you rightly pointed out in the preamble, in the old uh, document and the new document, the old document Commission General is expressly stating that this document is being issued under Section 27 of the Inland Revenue Act exercising its power. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can see the second document, what does that say? It doesn't say about uh, him exercising power under the Section 27 of the Inland Revenue Act and uh, issuing this document. It says this document is being issued at the instruction of the uh, Secretary to the Ministry of Finance uh, as instructed by the Minister of Finance. Okay. So you can see the, it's, it's, it's very interesting. So is this that against thing. the law? He doesn't say that he has issued this uh, under the Inland Revenue Act, he, uh, under Section 27 of the Inland Revenue Act. Because uh, if you ask me the question, yes, uh, whether this is against the scheme of the Inland Revenue Act, yes, because basically when uh, cash allowances are being paid, Commission General does not have the power to say that uh, out of the cash allowance, only 25% uh, to be taxed. Mm -hmm. He does not have the power. By doing that thing, he's reducing the tax liability imposed by the uh, Parliament. In Parliament, uh, in the Inland Revenue Act, Section 5.2 uh, goes on to say that when a travel allowance is given, any allowance is given, that is liable for tax. So who is going to benefit out of this? Who is the select group? Okay, select group is that uh, persons who are entitled uh, due to a circular directive or a regulation issued by the, by on behalf of the government of Sri Lanka. Mm. Definitely not the private sector. Definitely not those who, those public servants, public sector employees who are not covered by that circular. So wherever that circular is there, uh, that uh, <laughs> circular scheme is there, the people who qualify that for that scheme. Uh, we've been talking about equitable taxation, equitable um, uh, living standards, but at the same time, I'd like to, uh, we, we don't have much time. So uh, th th there's the value of transport facilities provided by the employer. There is uh, the, the circular and um, in terms of, I don't understand what it means by more than, uh, there's a differentiation here for 1,800 cc uh, vehicle and above or below. And earlier it was, um, well now it's any vehicle. So what okay, is okay, this? Let I, I'm, uh, I, okay, let me, let, me, let me explain that uh, scenario. So yeah. now what happens is when you're in employment, okay, you are being given uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. Right. Now the earlier rule was depending on the engine capacity of the vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, so the big vehicles or small vehicles, right? Uh, so if the engine capacity was above 1800 cc mm -hmm. and in case of electric vehicles there's another value that is given kilowatts. Mm -hmm. So in other words, basically they made a distinction between uh, big vehicles, say SUVs and the Mercedes mm -hmm. as opposed to small vehicles, mm -hmm. right? Uh, earlier under the uh, if you if, if the company or the employer was giving a small vehicle below 1800 cc only 20000 to be taken for tax purposes mm -hmm. and uh, driver driver if it's given with the driver plus the fuel you can see a 10000 uh, 10, 10, for the driver and for the fuel another 20000 20, so only 50000 to be added in case of small vehicles small. so they say but not more than 1800 cc fuel or yeah. hybrid and not more than 200 uh, yeah that's exactly KW electric right? yeah. Yeah. vehicle correct so then you have second, this is the second category. Mm -hmm. No, basically, uh, if the if it's a big vehicle that is above 1,800 cc, then it's amount to be added is can just uh, 35,000 mm -hmm. as opposed to the 20,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you can see that if it's given with a driver and a uh, fuel, mm -hmm. 
then in total 75,000 mm. to be added. Because driver 10,000 and 30,000 yeah, for exactly. fuel. Mm -hmm. Whereas for small vehicle, then it used to be 50,000 everything put together and 75,000 in case of big vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now what has happened is any vehicle. So the distinction based on the engine capacity or the power has been taken out. Any vehicle, irrespective of whether it's a very small vehicle or a big vehicle like a CUV, you uh, still pay the you still pay the small, small cars taxable value. Exactly. value. So now what has happened here? Here what has happened? Normally who gets uh, big vehicles? Yeah. So let's see the. I use this phrase: persons with broader shoulders. The concept in taxation is persons with broader shoulders should bear more tax, basically. But here what happens is the persons with broader shoulders are being given tax relief. Whereas uh, the uh, small person who gets a recipient of a small vehicle uh, is not getting a relief. The relief is being extended to the relief, the taxes that were being paid by a small taxpayer or uh, person who was getting a small vehicle is being extended to the persons who are getting big vehicles also. So is this the reason behind this uh, to different the purpose? Yeah, so you can see basically, I yeah, mean, so basically. I don't see anything else here. Yeah, so that's why, this, that, that's why when you look at this uh, circular, the question mark comes to my mind, mm -hmm. what is the purpose? Are we following the concept of taxation? Mm -hmm. Are we trying to protect the people with broader shoulders or are we trying to give relief to the weaker? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, something else uh, I'd like to touch upon is about concessionary staff loans. I don't understand the concept there. If you may also explain to us ah, okay. what this that taxable is. Yeah, so that's basically uh, saying the in case of banks or in, in case of companies even when a uh, loan is being given to the a staff member, mm -hmm. we call it staff loans. Normally when the market rate is uh, let's say uh, at 12%, uh, sometimes basically we give that uh, company extend the loan to a staff member uh, let's say at 4%. So then you, there's a difference between the market rate, let's say the 12% and the uh, interest uh, charge from the staff member, which is 4%. Mm -hmm. So difference between the 12% and the 4% is taken as a benefit and uh, according to the strict law, it's liable for income tax, right? Now, according to this speculation, this uh, stipulation, that is not to be taxed. So who will benefit? Okay, the employees uh, who are working in banks, that is where you find uh, most of the staff loan concept is there. Not only that, even in case of, uh, even in case of uh, companies, if they're giving staff loan, mm -hmm. uh, that's not, uh, that differ interest differential is not uh, liable for tax. So it's a welcome move, right? that, that is relief. Right, back in uh, 2022, last year, during the budget, you mentioned about uh, certain structural changes that we need to bring about, and also you had some proposals in terms of um, uh, having a presidential um, tax commission, and also you spoke about a tax ombudsman's uh, necessity here. Um, do you still believe in this? Yes, of course. Sri Lanka badly needs, uh, I think what, the t if I'm not mistaken, the term I used at that time was a national uh, tax council, or what IMF is calling uh, tax policy unit, tax policy uh, unit, right? So Sri Lanka does not have that thing. We need a robust tax policy unit in order to ensure there is uh, proper tax uh, policies are being formulated. Mm -hmm. Here what we find in Sri Lanka is from time to time we are tinkering. Now what is this uh, document again that we discussed so uh, again basically tinkering things. Mm -hmm. This is not what we should be doing. So in the budget uh, last time there was a budget proposal. There were two budget proposals. One in order to prepare a proper tax policy for Sri Lanka to appoint a presidential taxation commission. Mm. In addition to that, uh, there was another budget proposal to provide uh, relief for those who are aggrieved by uh, tax issues or mal malfunctioning, malpractices mm. or whatever, to create this uh, office of tax ombudsman. So tax ombudsman, so the, the you have authority to go to, to uh, complain. Now, both these budget proposals still have not been implemented. I don't know whether any steps have been taken even to uh, implement this. Mm -hmm. And uh, could this, it's, it's the need of the harbor. I think uh, basically we need to ensure uh, tax policy making is uh, robust and we need to have that uh, tax policy unit. And for that purpose, uh, maybe have the uh, Presidential Tax Creation Commission uh, implemented fast. And uh, of course, introduction of the tax ombudsman. Uh, you did mention earlier too that uh, the, the broad shoulder should be able to bear uh, 
the burden, the weight of this, uh, the, the, the taxation, and also the weight of this, this policy. But going forward, we've been talking about sustainable taxation, sustainable policy in order for Sri Lanka's reforms also to be more equitable, sustainable. So how do you think government can take a step towards this? Okay, so no one is, no one is, uh, no one likes to pay taxes. So it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, task, I understand the thing, but I believe there has to be more effort from the point of view of the government uh, to formulate proper tax policies and not just do this uh, ad hoc things, right? So that's I suggested, basically, we need to have this uh, tax policy unit established uh, and the requisite other tax uh, related institutions to be uh, introduced to the uh, uh, fabric of the uh, Sri Lanka tax regime. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Pereira, for your time here. I think um, uh, we spoke about a few areas, but still you were able to give us uh, uh, a more uh, comprehensive overlook of what's happening, especially in relation to the more recent circulars, the amended versions um, that we spoke about. Thank you for your time here at Hyde Park. Thank you, Indira, for calling me. Uh, we had with us uh, Mr. Suresh Pereira, Principal Tax and Regulatory for KPMG Sri Lanka, uh, a tax consultant specializing in the area of tax, accounting and legal matters. We had with us uh, um, the, the, the professional to discuss about Sri Lanka's tax policy, but essentially how individuals are taxed in relation to the most recent amendments. We'll be back next week with yet another discussion at Hyde Park.